This is Twit. China does it again, says Space News. China launches Chang'e 6 to the moon, and this, I believe, is going to the far side, yes? Yes, it's going. they're going back to the far side. So Chang'e 6 uh, lifted off you know, today as we're recording this, and it's, uh, it's got a, a pretty ambitious mission uh, ahead of it. And this story, like you mentioned, is from Space News, uh, but uh, Space.com covered it, too, if you want to see that version. Um, but uh, Andrew Jones over at Space News had a lot of really great details because, you know, it can be pretty difficult to get uh, some, uh, some details from uh, China's space program just in general. Yes, indeed. <laughs> But uh, but this one is really interesting because instead of just going back to the lunar far side, uh, they're going to go back with this uh, this new lander. Uh, it has a camera. It has uh, uh, you know panoramic uh, panoramic uh, imaging systems, ground penetrating radar to do all of the things you would want uh, a lander to do on the moon. Uh, but it's also going to collect samples, uh, d- lunar dust and rocks, and retrieve the first ever samples back uh, from the far side uh, to Earth. So not content to be the first country ever to land successfully on the far side of the moon. Uh, They're going to bring the first samples back too. And in a really kind of interesting twist, China is not the only passenger on this mission. They're actually working with a a lot of international uh, partners from France, from Sweden, from Italy. Uh, They're carrying a Pakistani CubeSat on this mission, which is a, a bit of an opening I think for their international cooperation, as I think you and I have talked in the past, Rod, about China's plans for the the International uh, Lunar Research Station. Right. Uh, so they're really setting the groundwork, and uh, and they've got even more ambitious missions planned with the follow up seven and eight missions in this series. So basically, everybody's coming to play except the United States. All right, pretty much. <clears throat> Space dot com says Boeing is on track. Prove it That's to me. Right. Well. <laughs> Just before we started recording, uh, NASA and Boeing completed their final flight readiness review for the uh, uh, the Boeing CFT crew flight test uh, mission, which lifts off at like 1034 p.m. at night on Monday or Eastern time on Monday, May 6th. They said everything is great. They've got a few final things to close out both on the space station to get stuff uh, ready for this new uh, mission and on, on the ground. But they're really confident, so confident that they're just looking at the weather right now. And there is a 95% chance of good weather on on uh, Monday night for the mission. They do have some backup days. They can launch on uh, any time between the 7th, uh, uh, 8th, and uh, I believe 9th and 10th, too. So those are all kind of backup days uh, for this mission. It gets a little bit earlier each night. Uh, but there, it, this seems like the home stretch, Rod. And the reason I put it on here is because, you know, by the time we meet again, Boeing may be in space with their first astronauts uh, on this spacecraft. However, they did just announce they're not going to be doing commercial missions for the knowable future, right? Well, I mean, they they, they, they have said, like, they've, they've hedged a lot uh, uh, back and forth about that. It wouldn't surprise me if they said it just, you know, as I was preparing for the podcast and I, I missed that today. Uh, but they have been on the record saying that they want to get through the NASA uh, contracts first. Uh, they've got these six missions and they haven't really been thinking yeah. too much about that, but they don't have a destination yet either. The one that they planned, I think that we mentioned before, was the Bigelow uh, Space Station uh, right. and Bigelow Aerospace. Uh, they're gone now. They, they've yeah. been you know, shuttered for a long time. So without a anchor place to go, uh, and then you're not an anchor tenant for anything. So well, they'll have to compete along with the rest of the uh, the folks. True, unless they could just go into orbit. Okay. Uh, uh, finally. Could, yeah. For, for, for tourist flights. From NASA JPL, we have the James Webb Space Telescope announcing that they've been, been able to image exoplanet weather or create exoplanet weather maps. I don't know if you'd call it imaging, but uh, to be able to map weather on a planet 280 light years away is yeah. definitely 2001 a Space Odyssey kind of stuff. You picked this one, huh? This one really caught your eye, huh? <laughs> well, I just thought it was remarkable, you know? It, it is. It is. It's uh, actually NASA is touting it as like an example of how far exoplanet research has really come. That right. they're able to do this with, they call it the, the MIRI instrument. It's this infrared uh, camera type on uh, the jet propulsion, or pardon me, on the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. And, and you're right. So this planet, it's called WASP-43b, and it orbits a star that's a lot smaller than our sun, um, but it's uh, 280 light years away, like you mentioned. And uh, it's, it's a really strange planet because it's the size of Jupiter, this planet, but it orbits the star like about 125th the distance of the, the between Mercury and our sun, which uh, 
It's crazy. That's like one, I think they said it's 1.3 million miles. Uh, so it's it's like kind of paltry. We're like 92 million miles away. From 93, the, 90, yeah. 93 yeah. million miles, yeah, from the from the, from the sun. So you're basically um, dragging your ankle in the sun at that yeah, point. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a tidally, it's a tidally locked planet, too. So one one side always faces the sun, its, its star. The other side is in permanent darkness. You would think that that would be frigid, right, because it's permanent night. But no, there's these winds, apparently, that, that James Webb has been able to, to, to pick up that blow around the equator at like 5,000 miles an hour that take that warm air all the way around. I don't know. It's crazy that they can detect all of that with this instrument. Uh, but but they did. They were able to figure all this out and, and that it's mixing up the atmospheric gases all around the planet. Uh, and it just gives them uh, a bit more hope for what else they can do with James Webb with maybe some more tantalizing locales, if you will, uh, of, of exoplanets out there, ones that might be in the habitable zone or where they could have liquid water because on Earth, wherever we have liquid water, we have life. That's why NASA keeps looking for water on Mars uh, and, and elsewhere. And, um, and you know, but they, they have been able uh, to use James Webb as well as some other telescopes to, to uh, detect what they think are thick high clouds all over the day side of this planet. It's pretty crazy stuff. So. Well, now that you mentioned it, I, I think it, it occurs to me that my first college dating experience is probably tidally locked and not on the bright side, but that's another conversation. <laughs> Um, before we go to the important part of this episode, which is Chris Carberry, uh, I, I do need to uh, clean up after last week where we talked about the pre-launch Russian tradition. So we got a couple of guesses. Brandon Evans wrote in and said, understandably, he would guess a swig of vodka. And unfortunately, okay. although that's probably part of it, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> and Mark Thomas said guest number one must involve drinking vodka or stripping down to their birthday suit in the elevator on the way up to the capsule and getting completely redressed before they arrive at the top. It's an extremely slow elevator or both. <laughs> and the answer is no. Actually, it That's is a good guess, though, <laughs> relieving oneself on the launch gantry before uh, going up to the spacecraft. And right. oh, Chris, there's more to it than that. Oh, Chris knows. There's Chris more than just relieving yourself. <laughs> oh, well, the reason I bring it up is that Valentina Tereshkova had to figure out how to do that after Yuri Gagarin started the tradition, which is potentially messy, but go ahead. No, this is part of a whole bunch of superstitions they do following the path of Yuri Gagarin. You know, yeah, that's the most famous part. And it's in my alcohol and space book, of course, you know, halfway. Well, they're also watch, always watch the same spaghetti Western in the bus that Yuri Gagarin um, watched. But before then, they also signed this hotel door. I believe they also sipped some champagne. So the whole ritual they go through, the superstition, following the path of Yuri Gagarin up to his first flight. It's really fascinating watching how much superstition is part of the Russian space program. Well, there you go. Always <laughs> good to know. And uh, I'll remember that next time I'm ready to fly. All right. And that's also the place where people have traditionally put the contraband in their spacesuits before they flew into orbit because they had to undo the spacesuit that had been pressurized before. They'd undo it there to relieve themselves. But then bottles of cognac would go in, other contraband would go in, and that's how they were smuggled up. <laughs> other uh, contraband, you say? Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there.